Welcome to City Church. We are a biblically based, relationally driven, spirit led church, encouraging everyone to follow Jesus, grow together, and serve others. We're excited to share this sermon with you today, and you can always find out more about us online at citychurchseville.com. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Now, if you would be risen, stand with me. I want to welcome all of you here to this worship service and those that are worshiping with us online. What we do at City Church and include it on every Easter Sunday morning as we say the Lord's Prayer together. If you're from the high church, it's probably known as the Our Father, but we love to say the Lord's Prayer together because it is the prayer Jesus taught us to pray as the central reality of the kingdom of God. So we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together out loud. This then is how you should pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth in Charlottesville as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. Turn, give your neighbor a fist bump, high five, hug, handshake, shoulder bump, whatever you want to do, greet one another. You could be seated. I want to begin this morning's sermon on Easter resurrection. I want to begin by having you think about a question. Here's the question. Think about a situation recently when you were asked a question and you were not sure how to answer it. Let me give you a couple examples. Let's say that you were away at college and you came home after a year and you bumped into someone you hadn't seen in a long time and they said, how's college? How do you answer that? Or maybe you're walking through your neighborhood Some little kid runs up to you and it's in the evening or at night and they grab your hand and say, how do stars work? Or maybe something along the lines of this, I just had an experience similar to this where um, um, my youngest daughter, my youngest child once wanted to ride horses so we went and rode horses together this past week. And uh, my knees and my inflexible tailbone are proof that I did that. But all that to said, um, we go to this horse place, and while the horses were being prepared by the cowboy and the cowgirl are getting everything ready, we're sitting there, and you do the normal awkward introductions, right, where you meet someone new, and you share names, and then there's always that fateful question, what do you do? Well, I've learned I need to ask that question first, and here's why, because as a pastor, when people say, what do you do, and I say, I'm a pastor, it goes, the air leaves the room. It just goes totally quiet. They're thinking, did I swear? Did I tell a dirty joke? You know, you can tell the math that happened. So I always ask first. And here's the case in point. I I turned to the lady of the couple that was there. They had two beautiful little children, all excited to ride, you know. And uh, I turned to the lady and I said, well, what do you do? And she said, I work at Johns Hopkins University. I said, that's awesome. And I said, what do you do? And she said, I'm a physicist. And the way she said it was, I know if I told you what I do, you would not get it, so don't ask. Do you know what I mean? Like, you're dumb, I'm smarter than you, don't bother, right? So, but the idea is we're presented with these questions, and I could tell by the look on her face, it was, don't ask me, just physics, don't, any, don't probe any deeper, you won't get it, right? So with that said, though, oftentimes we are asked a question And you're not really sure how to answer it because you don't really know how much the other person knows. I've already confessed I'm terrible at math, so physics, not a chance. But the idea is, is you're asked a question, you think, well, how much does the person know? Um, How long do we have to talk? Are they really truly interested? You know what I mean? Like you do the quick mental math. Listen, I'm going to be dealing with the resurrection of Jesus this morning. I have about 17 minutes. And with that said, Here's what you need to know. 
The entire Older Testament, which is two-thirds of your Bible, is looking towards the resurrection. And the rest of the Bible, after the Gospels, looks back to the resurrection. It's literally the high water mark of the entire scriptures. I don't want to bum you out, but Christmas is not the point of the Christian faith. It's the resurrection. And listen, to be clear, if Jesus had not been resurrected from the dead, you would have never heard about Christmas. Never. And so what we're going to do this morning is I'm going to try to deal with Some basic realities or some thoughts are very prayerfully, I felt led to share just two or three things about the resurrection that would help all of us kind of come to an understanding of something about the resurrection. With that said, here is a book that I want to encourage you to get if you would really like to dig deep into the resurrection. It's an awesome book by N.T. Wright, but if you wanted to go deeper into the resurrection, that's a great book for you to read now. What we're going to do is we are going to take a look at Easter, which truly is Jesus and the resurrection. That's Easter. Now, with that said, we're getting ready to read in the scriptures where Jesus and resurrection are first brought together. If you want to study the Bible well, there's this biblical study law called the law of first mention. And if you're actually going to study a topic, you start where it's first mentioned in the Bible and then you proceed from there. We're going to read where Jesus and resurrection first come together, and he mentions it. Then we're going to take a look at the resurrection together. There's a reason why, though, we're going to look at this law first mention, the original announcement of Jesus and resurrection. And here's the context for what we're getting ready to read. Jesus is an itinerant rabbi, And in the ancient world, if a rabbi came to your town, you would let them stay with you. Hospitality in the Middle East is just basic. It's hospitality. We know from the gospel that these three people Jesus is getting ready to deal with, he has stayed at their house before. There are three siblings. Their names are Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Now, this encounter is going to be unique. He stayed at their house before. But this time, Jesus has received word that Lazarus, the brother, has died. And so Jesus is now responding to the request that he would come. The text tells us people from Jerusalem have come to mourn and grieve with Mary and Martha. And Jesus arrives at the house, and when he does, Martha comes out of the house to meet him, and here's what she says to him. Jesus, if only you had been here my brother would have never died. How many times do we say to God, God, if only you had done X, Y, or Z, my life would be different? She starts with that. Jesus, if you had only been here, my brother Lazarus would not have died. And here's his response. John eleven twenty three 23 through 27. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection. There we go. Law of first mention. In the resurrection, when? What does it tell us? When? At the last day, which is a euphemism in Scripture for the very end of time. So we have a woman who believes in resurrection, but when is resurrection going to happen? At the end of time. Now, Jesus responds to her the following way. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, I want you to notice he doesn't just say, I am the resurrection. He says, Martha, just so you know, what you need to know, Martha, is from now on, resurrection will be found in a person. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection. And he doesn't stop there. He says, and the life. Resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, Jesus said, will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. Now again, she believes in the resurrection, but when is it supposed to happen? at the end of time, and notice it brings her no comfort, 
and no peace. It's a theological theory that's quite amorphic and is off the edge of the horizon. She knows that God will do it, but it's at the end of time, and it brings her no peace with her brother Lazarus. Now, we're getting ready to read Matthew's account of the resurrection. I've chosen this one because it is the most colorful of them all, the most action-filled. But before we read from Matthew 28, 1 and following, I just want you to know this. In New Testament times, people knew that when you were dead, you were dead. As moderns, we think we know a bunch of stuff that ancients didn't know. Now listen, very carefully. People in the ancient world knew that if you were dead, you were dead. And if you were crucified, you were dead, dead. No one survives crucifixion. You are dead, dead if you're crucified. So with that understanding in mind, let's read the resurrection account from the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Here we go. 28.1. After the Sabbath at the dawn of the first of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, that's Mary, the wife of Clopas. So Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone, and sat on it. Just picture it this way. You ever see someone chill on the beach with their hands behind their head and their feet up? That's my vision of this angel. He went to this stone that weighed a couple of tons, flicked it with his pinky finger, it rolled, wobbled, fell over, and he's chilling just like that. Just my humble opinion. Here we go. His appearance was like lightning, And his clothes were white as snow. And the guards were so afraid of him, they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, the two centurion had passed out with fear. So there's two women left. And he says to them, don't be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. And what does every first century person know for certain happens to someone that's crucified? They are dead, dead. Reading on, he is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you so. The women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, which is another way of saying a lot of mixed emotions. Afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said, and they came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There you will see me, or they, there, there they will see me. Now here's what I think we need to know as we begin to take more of an in-depth look at resurrection. I just read the most colorful, action-filled account of the resurrection there is in the gospel. If you were to compare it with Christmas, this thing is a dud. Christmas has an angelic choir, has light shining in the darkness, has an angel that comes down, has magi that show up, has a group of shepherds that are being invited by angels. It's lit up. The night sky's lit up. There's a lot of drama, a lot of people, a lot of messages, a lot of commotion. But when you look at the resurrection story of Jesus, if you're a marketing expert, you want to say to God, let me give you a little help. If this is the event of the Christian faith, it's kind of understated. You know what, God, you really need to do is take out a full screen at Times Square. A lot of flash stuff. Take out a full-page ad in the Jerusalem Times. That's what you ought to do. But what you discover is the resurrection is very humble and understated. And here's why. If it's true, you'll never stop it. You don't need marketing. Because if Jesus has now been raised from the dead and what was said to be only for the end of time has now happened in the middle of time, then everything has changed. 
If the resurrection has happened in the middle of time, not at the end of time, then everything has changed. Now, what I want us to do is we're going to take a brief look at the resurrection. In order to do this, I would like for you to think of two Marys in your life. How many of you here know two Marys? Just raise both hands if you know two Marys. Yep, you know two. What I want you to do is stand in front of the empty tomb with two Marys. These two Marys that you picture in your mind. I have two in my mind. One is Mary Jameson, who's a woman at our church who had a baby on Friday. Good Friday baby. And then there's another person, her name's Mary Barna. Mary's way up in senior of years. She took me into her house when I first started out in ministry. Two Marys. And I stand in front of the tomb with these two Marys. When I come there, it's empty. And I have to decide why. Why is the tomb empty? The next paragraph in the Gospel of Matthew gives you an out. Some of the Jewish leaders paid off those Roman soldiers that fainted and said, here's some money. Just tell everyone the disciples came and stole the body. There's always a parallel counter-argument. But what do I believe is I stand there with these two Marys and I discover that the tomb is empty. So what I want to do now, again, this isn't a complete, it's partial, but prayerful. I would like to answer the question, what does the resurrection or Easter accomplish? What does it accomplish? First of all, what does the resurrection mean theologically? Death is already dead or defeated. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 14 looks back in the latter part of the Newer Testament to the resurrection and says the following. Brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. Notice that in the Newer Testament, if you die in Jesus, you're denoted as only sleeping. You're not dead dead. You're dead. You're not dead dead. Reading on, and it says... We don't want you to grieve like the rest of mankind who has no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 58. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God... He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, me and you, stand firm, let nothing move you. When we think about Jesus' resurrection, defeating death, most people think the following. They picture being in Monticello Gardens right there in front of Mickey Tavern and the ground is opened up and there's a box with a person in it and they're getting ready to put the box down into the ground. That's what people think about death. That's only a very small part of what death is biblically. Just so we all know, death in the Bible is an act of force that opposes everything that is the good of God in the world and makes you flourish. It opposes all of it. Death is a force. It's not just a body in a casket being lowered into the ground. It is a force from the first pages of the Bible that opposes God's best and human flourishing and everything that's beautiful in creation. That's what death is. And death, just so you know, goes far beyond just someone in a grave. Death is the following. Death is disease and murder. Hatred, bitterness, unforgiveness, rage, greed, selfishness, jealousy, guilt, and shame. You see, the fingerprint of death isn't just about that open hole in Monticello Gardens that's about eight feet deep and eight feet long. Death is this force that opposes God's best in my life and yours. And the scripture teaches us that Jesus was resurrected up through that. And he has victory not just over the grave, but death itself. Next, what does resurrection mean for us personally? What it means is the possibility of a new life in Jesus. Remember, Jesus says to Martha, I'm the resurrection and the life. 
Romans 6, 8 through 9 says, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that Christ, since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. It's not just the grave. It is death. That thing called death that opposes God's best no longer has any mastery over him. And so what does that mean personally for us? It means that you and I have the opportunity to live a new life. That in Jesus, there's the resurrected life. When I put my faith, hope in Jesus, there's a transformation that happens within me. And here's what I've noticed. I've noticed that this transformation does incredible things. One of them is, you believe that there truly is goodness in the world. You believe that you can be partner with God and see God's best begin to happen in the world. The other big thing is forgiveness. Because here's what I know. There are a lot of people who wake up every day and death wins. They wake up every day and it's guilt and shame. That's the fingerprint of death. But you see in Jesus, there's this incredible forgiveness that God brings. Jesus didn't just conquer the grave. He conquered that power that comes against people to squash them and bring about the least and the worst that life can bring. What does it mean practically, or I'm sorry, personally for us? It means there's a resurrected life. And lastly, what does resurrection mean for us practically? It's a life that's not controlled by fear. You see, in Matthew 28, 5, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. By the way, don't be afraid or fear is mentioned three other times. You see, the accurate way to read a text is to look at the most repeated theme. The most repeated theme in that episode was fear. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. There's something about the resurrection of Jesus that allows people who trust him and put their faith in him that their lives are no longer controlled by fear. One final verse. Hebrews 2 14 through 15. Since the children have flesh and blood, me and you, he, meaning Jesus, shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. And death is not just about the grave. It's about all the things we mentioned that death brings against God's best in order to suppress our flourishing and the best that God has for us. So how do we put feet to our faith? Would you stand with me? As we stand together and we think about putting feet to our faith, what I'd like you to do again is take just a moment and stand in front of the tomb with your two Marys. Stand there with both of them. And as you do, and especially maybe for those thinking people among us, I want you to think about the following. What's interesting to note is these two women leave the grave. They meet the resurrected Jesus, they believe, and then they go and tell the disciples. This is important to think about, extremely important. Before Jesus shows up as a Messiah, there were about a dozen Messiahs before Jesus, people who claimed to be. Many of them led military revolts. You know what Rome did to all of them? Crushed them and killed the leader. And when that happened, each one of those movements made a choice. They made one of two choices. When the leader's killed, you either roll up your banner and go home or you pick a new leader. 
I want you to know something about Christianity. Neither of those happened. When Jesus was killed and resurrected, the disciples said, He still leads us. You want to know why? He's alive. And by the way, they had a logical choice. Because James, the brother of Jesus, was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He was the ready-made new guy to be declared as the new Messiah. They never do that. James doesn't do that. But the entire movement points at Jesus and says the reason why is because he has been raised from the dead and he has conquered death. Let's pray. Jesus, as we stand in front of an empty tomb with two Marys, we now by faith turn around and see a resurrected Jesus. What do I believe? Amen.